Welcome to my session, Lazy Flutter Performance. In this talk, I want to argue that when you look at the performance of your app and the smoothness of your animations on the screen, just as important to what's slowing things down is what's just off the screen. I want to look at lazily loading this content so that it's ready to go just when it's needed and how the Flutter APIs guide you towards doing this in a performant way by default out of the box. So to explain a little bit with a real example of a complex app, this here is the Stadia app and it's built in Flutter. And here we have a big list of games with some rich images and animations when the animation happens. And we need that list to scroll at 60 frames per second. But the hard part isn't what you see in the screenshot. It's really just the tip of the iceberg. The hard part are all of the assets that are lurking just under the surface, ready to slow everything down. These other items in the list need to be ready to go on the screen at any time that the user scrolls and it needs to do it at 60 frames per second. This is a pretty hard problem, but Flutter makes it easy to solve. It guides you towards writing a fast app, but it also gives you the tools that you need to make your own custom implementations that are equally as fast. So in this talk, we're going to take a look at a few examples of all of the above. So I am Justin. I'm a software engineer on the Flutter team at Google. And I spend most of my time working on GitHub, contributing to the framework and helping move things along. But uh, one thing that I think about a lot in the scope of my work is how do we make widgets and Flutter's APIs both easy to use for the usual cases, but also very customizable and powerful when needed. I think this is a really hard duality to get right. We spend a lot of time working on this at Flutter, and I think it applies a lot to today's topic with uh, lazy performance. So throughout the course of the talk, we're going to look at three different examples. The first is similar to the screenshot we saw of the Stadia app. We've got a one-dimensional list view that scrolls. Uh, next, we're going to look at a two-dimensional grid and how the same principles of performance and lazy loading can apply to different widgets like this. And uh, the third example that I want to look at is uh, a fun one doing procedural generation to generate content randomly right when it's ready without having to keep any of that stuff in memory. The first thing I want to do is uh, try to reproduce the problem. So I've got this Marty McFly animated SVG asset here that I got from Rive. It's uh, animated, it's a little bit heavy, so it's going to help us slow things down and, and try this out. And we're going to put a bunch of these on the screen in a list. So uh, first of all, we've got a red X here because if this is just the naive uh, implementation of how you might do this in Flutter. So uh, with a single child scroll view, if we just give it a list of children, it's going to render all of these Flutters, going to keep track of every widget that's created, whether or not it's on the screen. So let's take a look at the code and try running this. So here's our list of Marty's. The Marty animation is pretty smooth. Uh, the scrolling also pretty smooth. And uh, we just have a short list there of 10. So let's bump that up to 100 and see what happens. I'll restart it, jump back to the app. All right, so I'm clicking to open that demo. There we go. So we're opening here. We can already see that the Marty animation is much slower and the scrolling is also very stuttery. And uh, we can see that there are a lot more items in the list uh, this time with the gradient here. So we are up to 100. So if I bump this up even higher to 1,000 and try that again, here we go. It's restarted and I'm clicking into that. And then just as a spoiler here, what's going to happen is that this is going to wait for about 60 seconds. It will either crash or it will eventually open the list of Marty's and it will be completely unusable. So I'm going to go ahead and kill that here and move on. So here I have already taken a look at the uh, profiling, the memory impact for all of the demos that we did. Um, 10 is roughly taking 15 megabytes, 100 um, in the range of 80, and 1,000 crash, and we couldn't even get grab that information at all. So this is about what we'd expect between 10 and 100. We have almost an order of magnitude increase in the amount of memory being used because we have an order of magnitude increase in the number of assets that we're looking at, uh, minus a little bit for the rest of the application. So now let's look at how we can do this in a performant way by using a simple widget that handles a lot of performance optimizations for us out of the box. So we're going to look at listview.builder. And here we have a performant way of handling this in the code. 
instead of a list of children, we've now got an item builder. And this is a function which is going to return a single item in the list. And this allows our list view internally to call this only when it needs to render that item that it needs to display just in time. So let's look at this in the code and try running it and see how the performance changes. So here in the code now we've got listview.builder with an item builder instead of a child. So here we're returning a single child, which is the Marty at the current index. And back up to our item count again, we're gonna start here at 100. And you see it opened quite quickly, much faster than our slow naive demo with 100 Martys. And the animation looks smooth and the scrolling also feels pretty good. And you can see we've got uh, a lot of Martys here. We've got a hundred, just like we said. So let's bump this up now to a thousand. And in the previous demo with single child scroll view, we could not even run this. But now that I've restarted, let's see how it does with listview.builder. And there we go, it opened just about as quick as the 100. The animation still looks smooth and the scrolling also pretty good. If I get going really quickly, there we go. I can get a little bit of pop in there. So we have some white screens as the asset is loaded because I'm loading all of these assets on their own separately for the sake of the demo. And you can see how slowly the gradient changes because we do have 1000 Marty's there. So let's take a look at what was happening under the hood in both of these widgets. So starting with the naive approach and the single child scroll view, this illustration shows all of the Martys that were being kept track of by Flutter off screen in black and white, even though they weren't visible to the user and only the colorful Martys in the center were visible. We still had to pay the price for all of those Martys, even when the list was enormous, maybe even a thousand Martys long. So with listview.builder, what we did is chop off all of the extra Martys and we only rendered a few off-screen Martys that were likely to be scrolled onto the screen in the very near future. And this allowed us to get rid of the huge list of up to a thousand Martys and just handle the next few constant number of upcoming Martys. And so the performance that we saw there, I went ahead and tried this out in the dev tools and grabbed the memory snapshot for each one of these. And you can see that each run, whether it was 10, 100, or 1,000, was taking just about the same amount of memory. So that's also what we would expect because the number of Martys that were actually being handled by Flutter didn't change with the number that were in the list because Flutter was holding them just off screen and getting rid of all of the extras and shuffling them around as the user scrolled. All right, so we saw our one-dimensional list like the Stadia app, but let's take a look at a slightly more complex example using Interactive Viewer. So here we've got a two-dimensional grid of Martys, and what Interactive Viewer does is it allows us to grab the screen and pan around and view different areas of the screen that aren't visible at the beginning. So uh, this is gonna have a similar problem that we saw before, and uh, the code is also going to look similar. So in this naive approach here, when we just pass a child to interactive viewer, Flutter is going to build that entire child subtree, in this case, a big list of Martys, rather a big grid of Martys. And what's going to happen here is that all of these black and white Martys are going to be handled by Flutter, just like we saw in the one dimensional case, we're handling way more than we actually need to show the user at any one time. So similarly to how we improved performance by using the listview.builder widget, we can use an interactive viewer.builder and uh, have a similar kind of pattern here to improve the performance. So with our builder function, um, instead of having Flutter handle everything for us, interactive viewer is a little bit more of a generic widget. It doesn't assume anything about the content that you're rendering. It doesn't know that it has a grid. So it's up to us to write our own builder in a way that's going to take advantage of any performance optimizations that we can make. Here, we've got our builder with a quad representing the viewport. So that's just four points in space that represent what the user can see at any time. And we're just going to do a simple optimization and check if any given cell is currently visible or not. If it's visible, we'll display the Marty. If it's not, we'll just render an empty cell. All right, so here we've got our naive 2D example. So we have our interactive viewer and we're just using a child once again, just like in single child scroll view. So all of this is going to be rendered, this entire widget tree. It's a grid containing a bunch of Martys. And uh, we're basing this on column count and row count. So up here, uh, we've got a 10 by 10 
grid totaling 100 Martys. So it's about as long as the 100 uh, naive single child scroll view example. And we can see the, the performance of the Marty animation is also similar, pretty stuttery as that example, and the scrolling as well. So here we've got interactive viewer dot builder with our faster example. We're using a builder parameter rather than a child. So this is called with a viewport and we're able to use is cell visible here to decide whether or not we want to display the Marty. If the Marty is visible on the screen, we're going to build him. If not, we're building an empty cell. And once again, up here at the top, we've got a row count and column count of 10. So we're doing 100 Martys. And let's go ahead and take a look at the running app. So down at the bottom, the fourth, uh, we're looking at the interactive viewer builder example. And I've clicked that and here it is. It opened a little bit of a delay, but still much quicker than our 100 Marty all at the same time example. This one, uh, as you can see, there's some pop in as I scroll. So this is loading more Marty's as I scroll and disposing the old ones as I go. And the performance of the animation is still quite good besides uh, the pop in that happens here as I load the new Marty's as we pan around. So it's not doing quite as complicated as the listview.builder with the shuffling of the cells in and out as the user pans, uh, but it is giving us this great performance uh, here when we just look at the animations and pan within the area visible. So it is a, a large step forward. Okay, so I've gone ahead and grabbed the memory snapshot for these two examples as well. And as you can see, the naive approach uses about three times the amount of memory as the interactive viewer.builder approach which again is about as we'd expect, as we are rendering a lot more Martys on the screen, but we're also having a big savings in the interactive viewer.builder by getting rid of the rest of the 100 in the total grid. So we've got a, a roughly a proportional level of memory use compared to the amount of Martys we're saving by not rendering off the screen. So to take a closer look again at what's happening here, in our naive approach, we have all of these black and white Martys, which are representing what Flutter is rendering internally and not displaying to the user. And in our interactive viewer.builder approach, what we do is we just say, if that Marty is off screen, we're not going to render it, but we are still rendering the empty grid cell. So it's not quite as optimized as what we saw in listview.builder because we're not shuffling around and generating these cells as they're needed. We're just not rendering the contents of them. So this kind of approach, it is a lot more custom, but it gives us the opportunity to do some fancier things as well. So how big can we go with this approach? Uh, if we do something that is generated only when the user needs it, how far can we push this kind of performance? So this brings us to our procedural generation example. Uh, I want to build a map for Marty, and I wanna make this map as big as we can, ideally infinitely big, and I want to generate this based on some seed only when the part of the map that we're looking at is needed. So as a warning, we're going to have some programmer art here, such as the grass that you see. Fortunately, we've still got our great Marty asset from Rive, but there's going to be a few assets that I had to draw myself. So I want to look at the performance uh, optimizations that we've been able to make here. We're going to break up this map into a bunch of nested tiles. So the green field that's visible itself will be broken up into tiles where uh, each tile has a few pieces of grass in it. And then we're going to group those into bigger tiles as we see here in black and white that we can manage uh, outside the context of what's visible on the screen. So the first optimization that we can make here with this approach is just to not load any assets that are not on the screen. So just like we did before, we're going to check if the asset is on the screen or not. And if it's not, we are going to leave it out. Uh, the other thing we can do, similar to listview.builder, we're going to get rid of any tiles that are far enough away from the viewport that they're not likely to be immediately panned into the screen. So we're just gonna render a three by three grid surrounding the viewport. And as the user pans around this much larger map, we're going to adjust what tiles are visible. So we can dispose the downstream tiles that the user's scrolling away from, and we can load the next tiles coming up and keep the three by three grid always surrounding the viewport wherever it goes. And here we are in the middle of some grass and some water, and we have a randomly placed Marty here. 
all of this being procedurally generated based on some seed. So I can scroll around and just keep going as far as I want. I've got a bunch of water here, but then eventually we get to like another continent of land here and we've got another randomly placed Marty. And this kind of just keeps going on and on. We can generate that. There's another Marty, he keeps popping up with his hoverboard. So we can just keep going in any direction and generating content. And the swapping of the nine tiles is happening just outside of the screen as we do this to keep things performant no matter how far we go. But I wanna talk about an even more complex optimization that we can make here. So Interactive Viewer does panning like this, but it also allows us to zoom. And zooming in works nice, but a zooming out is going to expand so far that our nine cell grid will eventually be too small to cover the entire screen. So what we can do here is to make another optimization and start grouping these cells into groups of 100 and simplifying them into something simpler so that we take our parent level and we make it shrunk down into basically another child level and we re-simplify everything. So as I zoom out here on the continent, I can replace the entire continent with just a big green cell with uh, some clouds of more uh, programmer art. And as I continue to zoom out, I can see we've got a whole planet here, a bunch of ocean and continents. And uh, as I continue to zoom out, I can simplify that yet again and just keep doing those levels of simplification as we go and really make this zoom as far out as I want to without running into the problem of having too few cells on the screen. So um, here I can see if I keep going, uh, we're actually part of a solar system here. That was our planet, but I can choose another planet and just zoom back in on any of these things, uh, choose a continent and zoom down on that. And it will generate our low level content once again with uh, nice animation performance, nice scrolling performance. All right, let's take a look back at all of the things that we saw today. So first we looked at an example of a list view that you might see pretty commonly in a lot of apps and how Flutter allowed us to get some really interesting performance optimizations in with just a few lines of code. We also saw how we can use the similar builder concept in a two-dimensional grid and how we can apply those similar concepts to get uh, performance gains on a totally unrelated widget. And then we took that a step further and built something totally custom with a procedurally generated map and saw how even a lot of the optimizations that are made in a one-dimensional list view can be applied to something custom like that. So like I said in the beginning, at Flutter, we think a lot about making things that are easy to use yet also powerful. And chances are, whatever experience you want to build, you can probably do it with Flutter. And hopefully, Flutter will guide you towards doing that in a performant way out of the box. All right, I've got a list of the documentation here on the right for each of the widgets that we take a look at today. And I've got the code for the demos that we ran on GitHub with a live example running right now. And I encourage you to check it out. And if you haven't already, be sure to take a look at all of the other talks from IO this year. Thank you guys.